Hopefully everyone can hear me. All right. And yes, this webinar is being recorded. Everything's going to be posted um, up later. So um, hello. Welcome to uh, this Metrovision Idea Exchange. My name is Emily Dauscher. I'm a planner on the Dr. Cog's regional planning and development team. Um, I'm going to kick us off with um, a few announcements as we let folks filter in here before I turn it over to our amazing panelists. So just some housekeeping for those of you who are here. Um, if you can add your organization to your Zoom name, we would really appreciate that. Um, and as I just said, we are recording this and we're going to share um, some of the slides after the event, um, which will have contact info and other links in them. Uh, we will send it out to those who are participating, uh, but we also will be posting it on our website on our event calendar. So um, before we get into it, this is a MetroVision ID exchange. Um, MetroVision, for those of you who don't know, is the shared guiding vision of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. And it's a set of outcomes, objectives, and voluntary initiatives for our many partners to consider. Uh, implementation of MetroVision is dependent on many partners uh, contributing through different pathways and at different speeds, which you will probably hear a lot about today. And these idea exchanges are opportunities to highlight how partners around the region are contributing to the implementation of MetroVision. So today, um, I'm going to have a couple of Dr. Cog announcements, should be pretty quick, and then I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. At the end of this session, there will be a 30-minute Q&A, um, but you are welcome to put your questions or comments in the chat throughout the duration of the webinar, so you don't forget. So announcement number one, um, so we, um, Dr. Cog staff, myself and my uh, colleague Dylan McBride, are visiting um, as many of our member governments as possible. We wanna meet with your long range planning teams to hear more about the work that you're doing in your community, your priorities um, and some other things. If anyone is interested in scheduling a meeting with us, we have been reaching out to folks, but um, if you wanna reach out to us, that would be awesome. You can email either myself or Dylan at those emails below. Um, or I think our contact info is online as well. The second announcement, we have a number of new tip set-asides. Um, some of you may be familiar with, with the Transportation Improvement Program and then the number of set-asides that come from it. Uh, we have a bunch of new ones that we'll be starting up this year. Um, the Livable Center set-aside is a um, set-aside focused on small area planning, um, and so land use and transportation. And that will be kicking off this year. We are hoping to have um, a webinar scheduled, um, hopefully soon, uh, to discuss this in more detail. But it, we have a nice handout um, on this set aside and others. So if you would like more info, you can send me an email and I will send that over to you. And that is all I have um, for now. So I'm going to turn it over to our first panelist, uh, Mitch and he'll get us started. All right, it moved around my unmute option. So uh, good morning, everybody. Can everyone see the screen? All right, fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Mitch Hendrick. I am managing the Innovative Affordable Housing Strategies Program here at DOLA. It's also known as the 1271 program. And since this program is not awarding any new funds, I'll keep this portion of the presentation brief so that you can hear from some of the communities who are doing this exciting work, as well as a couple of other program managers who have some new funding opportunities to learn about today. So the 1271 program, if you're not familiar, was established back in 2021 to, uh, to remedy the affordable housing crisis in Colorado, specifically through using stimulus funding uh, and grants to incentivize municipalities and counties to remove land use regulatory and development review process barriers, as well as adding other incentives to developing affordable housing. 
And some of you on this call are recipients of one or both of the program's grants in the planning or incentives grants. And I've got a slide here that kind of highlights what was seen in the incentives grant side of things. So this is funding that was actually dedicated to building or acquiring affordable housing, supporting it in another number of ways. Through two rounds, we uh, made 29 awards around the state with uh, about 40 million in awards and contributing directly to about 2000 units of affordable housing. Some of that's happening right now. Some of that is happening a little bit longer term thanks to some land banking products that we have. You can see on the bottom that there's quite a bit of projects that are being funded and variety. This was a very flexible funding source that funded infrastructure and site work, property acquisition, water and sewer tap fees, uh, the purchase of modular units and construction, development rebates for in Colorado Springs, uh, demolition in Salida to make way for new affordable housing, and the development and construction of a modular factory in Boulder in partnership with Habitat for Humanity. So quite a few exciting products here, and I would be happy to chat later about some of these. And just a note that thinking about the future funding sources you'll hear about is uh, many of these grantees did leverage various partnerships with nonprofits and other entities to make some of these projects happen and increase the affordability within them. This map, as you can see, is a little bit more filled out, and this is the planning grant map. The 62 planning grants were awarded around the state, so you see those blue counties and then each of the municipalities with a dot on the map. Those are all of the participating communities. And it's much, there's actually 103 participants within those 62 grants, thanks to quite a few regional projects around the state. Several of those are focused on the Eastern Plains, doing a variety of different planning projects. And when you're looking at these, there's about five and a half million dollars of planning work awarded throughout the state through seven rounds of funding. You'll hear about a very similar program coming up in the Strong Communities Program if you're looking to do more of this type of work. And within these communities, over 300 of our qualifying land use strategies aimed at reducing uh, and mitigating some of the affordable housing issues around the state are being pursued by our grantees. So before I pass it off to some of our grantees, uh, Wheat Ridge, I want to quickly hit on what we're seeing so far, we're seeing a, quite a bit of communities look at uh, authorizing ADUs by right, uh, reducing or subsidizing the development review process to make it quicker and easier and more predictable for developers, uh, allowing smaller square footage for units, promoting some of that naturally occurring affordable housing, uh, looking at vacant property for affordable housing, uh, improving or creating an inclusionary zoning ordinance, as well as actually establishing affordable uh, uh, housing authorities, which we've seen happen in a couple of our communities who've resulted in taking that housing authority and then applying for incentive grant funds and using that to build more affordable housing locally. So if you would like to learn more about what we're seeing right now, we've got about 65 strategies in place and adopted through the program with about 320 more being explored please reach out to me after or, or pop a question in the q and I'd be happy to try to answer that for you. So on to the exciting portion of the presentation, I'm going to pass it off to Jeff Hurt at Wheat Ridge to talk about their process. Thank you, everybody. All right, Jeff, do you have the share function on your end? Cool, thanks. Yeah, and thanks for the opportunity. I'll pull up my slides here. Okay, unless anyone tells me different, I'll assume you can see slides. Um, yeah, thanks again for the opportunity to be here and kind of share our story. I look forward to a, a good discussion um, and, and uh, hopefully some relevancy for what we did in Wheat Ridge to what folks are tackling uh, around the region. So um, I'm going to be like 10 minutes ish, but uh, thought I would first start with just some orientation to Wheat Ridge, uh, a little bit of grant context and our overall approach for the strategy, curveballs that we had through our process, the specific outcomes that came out of our strategy, not getting too much into the weeds, um, but uh, kind of a tailored action list and then our sort of overall timeline, um, how long it took us to get, get to the adoption. So Wheat Ridge is, for those not familiar, kind of sandwiched between Arvada and Lakewood, uh, unincorporated Jefferson County to the west, or immediately adjacent to Denver. 
Um, so very much an infill or a, um, inner ring suburb. Um, our population is about 32,000. You see, we haven't grown that much and that's due to a number of factors. Um, certainly not demand for development and housing in Wheat Ridge because we're right next to Denver. That's obviously a high demand place right up against the mountains. Um, so some of the reasons we haven't grown a lot are one, we're mostly built out and, and landlocked. We don't have a lot of greenfield uh, development. Um, another big one, and I think we're the only city in the state where we actually have a city charter limit on building heights and residential density. Um, so it actually requires a vote of the people to densify the city. Um, we also, a couple of other things that might resonate with folks, um, really before this grant, which has um, been amazing for us, we um, had basically zero affordable housing policies or rules, nothing in our zoning code, nothing in our comp plan, barely even mentioned the word affordable. So we were basically starting from scratch um, and this grant really enabled us to sort of catalyze the process. Another thing, still the case with us, we don't have any housing staff. So there's no person dedicated to working on housing affordability. Uh, we're just kind of a small planning shop that saw this opportunity. Um, I have a couple of data points here just to give you some sort of market context. Our median single unit detached housing price as of a couple of years ago, at least, is about $600,000, which is comparable to surrounding cities, um, a little bit less than Golden. Um, prices have gone up like they have everywhere. Um, townhouses are going up, condos are going up, but our breakdown of types of units is we're approaching about 80% single unit detached. So a very suburban, low density kind of community, which I'm sure a lot of folks um, on the call uh, that resonates with you. Some of the data we, that came out of our needs assessment portion of the strategy showed that um, we have about 36% of our households are cost burdened. Uh, meaning 30% or more of their income on housing costs, um, over half of our renters cost burden. Uh, so some of the context about the grant itself, um, like I said, we really didn't have any policies or rules on the books, um, but it was obviously like everywhere, a bubbling issue statewide and locally. People had been talking about it for years, but it wasn't even on the city council work plan as a priority to address, um, but we heard about the grant went in front of council and they said, yes, please go after that. Um, so it really catalyzed this project and we got our award in uh, late 2021. Um, our approach, which I th thought would be helpful for folks exploring this or have already been through it was maybe a little bit different than some other communities. Um, we didn't overall focus on workforce housing. Obviously there's a spectrum of housing need, right? But ours was very focused on workforce housing. We thought it'd be a lot more politically palatable. Um, council was very supportive of focusing on, you know, the teachers, the firefighters, et cetera. Um, we've got a pretty active homeless program. Um, so, and that's where we thought we could most have the most sort of bang for our buck. Um, one of the things we also did was kind of framed it as more of a technical exercise. So we, it wasn't a lot of sort of like values discussions. We had already kind of had those through different surveys and things. We've heard that from people that it's really, really important um, so we, we kind of framed it as a technical exercise, which is basically like, let's look at the numbers. What would yield the best outcomes for workforce housing that the city could do? And another thing we did that I think made it a more efficient kind of um, expeditious process was we stayed out of map based recommendations. So we didn't look to densify any certain areas. We kind of punted that to the comp plan, which is about to launch here. Um, so that was a big thing for sort of like being able to get it through, frankly, um, more efficiently. Um, and then certainly we want this strategy to have a life, you know, a life beyond the staff here. So we wanted a really clear, discrete action plan, uh, which I think we accomplished. Um, some of the curveballs that we got were, the biggest one really was that once we started, council was very supportive of us going after this grant and they were like, yeah, it's important. Our constituents are telling us it's, a, it's important, let's do this. But when we actually like started to roll up our sleeves, and develop strategies. There was skepticism by several members of council basically saying like, I'm not even sure this is a real problem that the market just won't fix. And they started citing specific projects, like look at this one, it's getting built, it's affordable. And so we were like, okay, we kind of looked at ourselves and the consultant team, like we have a problem here. Um, we need to like pivot a bit. And so we had several work sessions with council that ended up being extremely helpful where we really just like got into the weeds and like develop these scenario spreadsheets where they could actually play with the numbers and figure out for themselves why housing was so expensive in terms of land costs and construction costs. So that was extremely helpful for 
um, council to kind of come around on seeing as, a, as an issue. And it did work, but it took a lot of um, pivoting of resources. So some of the outcomes that were enabled with the strategy were one, just a deeper understanding of our own market and how the city could actually intervene and our own limitations and opportunities. We didn't have any policies or principles to guide our, any of our housing decisions. And we have those now. Um, we kept the action item list to 10, which was very helpful. But I think one of the most important things is just an, a better understanding on council's behalf of what the problem is. And we've seen a shift in their decision making. They're looking at projects differently now uh, through a through a more educated lens and supporting projects that they wouldn't otherwise support in terms of different types of housing. A um, couple other things, and I'll wrap up um, that I think might be of interest to you. And I knew this is a lot; you can't read all of it. But one of the sort of core components of our strategy was breaking down our housing market into target markets. So basically, like twenty five thousand dollar increments. Um, and looking at each of those increments and if there's a deficit or a surplus of housing units that align with those needs and which of those kind of buckets can the city have the most opportunity to uh, intervene and, and make a positive impact. So this was a really helpful framework for us where we basically said lowest income, obviously a priority and important and the highest need, but we as a city and a small city with low resources aren't really equipped to address that group, um, we should support others that are better equipped. Where we can have the most bang for our buck is, like I said, in sort of the workforce housing bucket. So, you know, the 80, 120% AMI range kind of um, approach. So this was a helpful kind of graphic and approach to orient the whole strategy around. And then our action plan, I know, again, this is too much to read, but um, we basically came up with 10 items that are very WeRidge specific. Um, and I know a lot of these overlap with, with the toolkit that everyone's looking at, but uh, making changes to our zoning to uh, have inclusionary policies. We're working on that right now, advancing that. We created a new housing fund. Um, we've got a big hospital campus, 100 acres, that's about to redevelop. And so this was a really important document for us to have the leverage to get affordability on that site. We really didn't have anything before this. Um, and another thing that we're really focused on is our naturally occurring affordable housing program, which we're trying to build now and get funding for. That was one of the WeRidge's biggest assets we found in the market assessment was our rental rates are actually surprisingly lower than the regions um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, our timeline, we're able to do this in less than a year. So from the time the consultant kicked things off. Um, so we just adopted our um, strategy in January of this year, and we're diving into the implementation and that's basically it for us. I know that's brief and high level, but um, project website is up here if you wanna get into the details and look at exactly uh, what the strategy is. There's a couple, we did a series of videos, like educational videos on what the problem is and what we're trying to do about it. Um, so uh, we're really proud of it and we're implementing it as we speak and hope that um, we can learn from others on this call and from Erie and happy to answer any questions. I'll turn it over to Erie. Sarah, you're muted. <laughs> I must have double clicked. Um, well, hello. I'm really excited to share with you uh, what URI is working on. And it was really interesting to see um, Jeff's progress through from zero to 60. Um, we've similarly had a, a very quick ramp up on addressing affordable housing in URI. Um, so my name is Sarah Nermella. I'm the Planning and Development Director, and I'm joined by MJ Adams, our very recent addition to the town as our affordable housing manager. And um, I, you know, I'll just point out that we are also addressing affordable housing anew for Erie. We've been looking at it for a couple of years as understanding it's an issue, but really getting um, a strategy and making and taking some actions has been uh, really the um, the focus of our past year of work. So with that, I will pass it over to MJ. <laughs> oh, did you? <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, got it. And I am a. I'll, I'll admit uh, that I am a recent transplant from Massachusetts. I've got about thirty five years of experience working in Massachusetts. Uh, and excited to be out here and delighted to be working with Erie, who clearly has had it 
on its radar. And I'm assuming you can see my presentation, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, wonderful. Um, and I'm sort of new with all this technology. So if I bumble along, uh, forgive me. We, we uh, have some technology in Massachusetts, but we're not as robust in using it as you seem to be out here. So, um, so I'm really delighted to be here today to do a presentation about what Erie has been up to. Uh, as Sarah indicated, it's been um, um, a topic of conversation among the town leadership for several years. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on that. Um, I'm going to introduce you a little to Erie, Colorado. I don't have a nice map like Jeff did because I'm not that technically skilled. Uh, and then I'll say why, you know, I'll give background on why affordable housing is a community issue. Uh, why IHOP, I know some people call it 1271. I'm still trying to figure the lingo out out here. Share with you what we've accomplished, where we're headed, and some challenges and opportunities we see on the horizon. So. Erie is just north of Denver. Um, in the, everybody calls it in the, the sweet little donut between uh, Denver, Boulder, and Fort Collins. So we've been experiencing an awful lot of growth uh, and we're grappling with that as we are also uh, stepping in. We've been do, starting to work on a comprehensive plan uh, for the community. And so growth is clearly up on everyone's mind. We have this beautiful little old historic downtown that's just a real attraction and it's just lovely and people wrap their arms around it and love to spend time doing all sorts of things in our little town center. Uh, we are served by both the Boulder County and St. Vrain school districts, which uh, as everyone tells me are two of the top school districts in Colorado and some of them even brag to be such nationally and we'll take that. And then uh, we've been voted the best town to raise a family. And we, that's on our logo, logo information. So we're very proud of that. And we promote it uh, quite openly and wantonly. So, so what about affordable housing? So um, Erie really started uh, ramping up and getting involved in the issue uh, as part of a regional effort. There was a, the Boulder County is a consortium of cities where they talk about, um, you know, big ideas together. It's the municipal leadership and uh, clearly uh, affordable housing and the impact that it has in terms of workforce housing uh, is really, really started to come to roost in 2016 and 2017 uh, in the Boulder County area. Um, in 2017, the Boulder County Regional Housing Partnership uh, convened a summit of the jurisdictions and out of that came a regional housing plan. Um, during uh, the following two years, it, the Regional Housing Partnership stayed um, active, very active, and uh, grew to include 12 jurisdictions, which includes Erie, uh, in the adoption of a regional housing plan. And the goal of this housing plan was that um, we would look to have 12% of all housing units uh, in Boulder County affordable by 2035. Then in 2020, Green, uh, Erie specifically signed on to the Regional Housing Partnership. And I should say the Regional Housing Partnership is not an entity, it is a partnership. It's a loosely formed group of community staff and um, and the county staff uh, working together to try to tackle this because we know housing is really a regional issue. It does not stay within the bounds of the community. And I think the regional housing partnership approach is really critical to getting traction and making stuff happen north of Denver. So uh, in 2021, uh, we had no housing staff at that time. In fact, we had a very small planning department uh, and the town staff were trying to make efforts to advance the inclusionary housing ordinance efforts. And that was really led, it looked like, uh, and I, I indicated I've only been here a couple of months, but looking back in the history of this, this was really under the leadership of our town manager, who uh, Malcolm Fleming, who really saw it as an issue and wanted to keep things moving forward. And then in 2021, uh, one of our very prominent local restaurants um, was, not able to reopen fully and decided to close business permanently because they were really looking at the difficulty of getting local workers to be able to work here, local employees to be able to work here in the restaurant business. And so that really prompted our economic development 
uh, staff along with the town manager to say we gotta you know roll up our sleeves and do something. So we really um, like like I said it was the economic development director and the town manager sort of collaborating to say we've got to find a better way to do this. Uh, at the same time, there was a little staffing turnover. Sarah joined the uh, staff, I think, in March of 2022. Uh, and so, and also, I'll say at that time, and Sarah can enlighten us all a little bit more about that, but the staff in the planning department grew from a relatively few number to, I think, we're a staff of 12 now. And, and the wonderful thing I can say is that the affordable housing manager, my position, and another position we have uh, coming on board uh, are embedded in the planning and development department, which I think is a critical piece of how we could be successful. So we received the grant award in 2022. They actually pulled, uh, like I said, Sarah joined the staff in March of 2022, and then they hired a uh, affordable housing manager with ARPA funds. And Ariel started uh, in May of 2022, and this is the time they brought on the consultant, and the consultant started doing work in the community. The first thing they did was really to do the housing needs assessment and start taking a look at strategy options. So in the summer of 2022, they started doing ga data gathering. You can see some of the stats, you know, 85% of the homes in Erie are single family homes. High, very high percentage are owner occupied. Average home price in 2022 was 850,000. And to purchase a home in Erie, you're looking at needing to make uh, about 100, the household needs to make about 150,000. And that, that is a really different income range than what we know our typical, you know, affordable housing programs could serve. This is, you know, that attainable, that 100, uh, the 80 to 120% of the area median income. So we were really looking at a very different um, population that we would, as we were talking about housing issues. So in the fall of 2022, they were clearly, you know, the, the education piece is critically important, even though kudos to the community for having had these ongoing conversations about it, but you really need to roll up your sleeves and talk about the, the nuts and bolts about what the data is showing you. And that started in fall of 2022. And then in the late fall in November and December, there were study sessions with both the board of trustees and the planning commission. We uh, then launched into 2023, where we had the new housing, affordable housing manager had re resigned and left town of Erie in 2023. The housing needs assessment was rolled out in, in February. Um, in April, I started uh, with absolutely no Colorado experience um, and launched into taking a look at where we were and starting to move things forward. And then in May of 2023, we, um, did a presentation. We had the help of Don Elliott, who was very helpful in talking about the complexity of affordable housing. Um, I'll share with you that uh, there, there was some um, consternation from the Planning Commission. They weren't really sure that it was really that big of an important or important of an issue, which is interesting because our clearly our Board of Trustees uh, and Mayor felt like it was a very critical issue. So there's there's been some movement because of that. Uh, so where we got the grant and we're wrapping it up and where are we now? Uh, I'm happy to report that uh, we were making, we um, one of the first things we wanted to do was to get fast track permitting in the works. Um, we hit the ground running with that and I'm happy to report that last night they approved it, our board of trustees approved it. Uh, I very quickly learned what Proposition 123 meant and we were able to navigate through, come up with some numbers and uh, create a commitment. Uh, the, Berkshire, uh, the Boulder County Regional Housing Partnership, we're doing an intergovernmental agreement because we've got Boulder, the city of Boulder that has a couple of decades of experience in running affordable housing uh, programs. And we know the critical importance of having people with experience and knowledge about the nuances and the challenges and the data of making that work for long-term compliance. So we're actually looking at working with the uh, city of Boulder to uh, have them run and help us with compliance on our affordable housing programs. And the regional housing partnership is the one that's really putting together and is the framework for those relationships, number one, to have been developed, but also for the partnership to grow deeper and to be a real regional partnership. 
Uh, we will um, continue to look at the uh, inclusionary housing ordinance. Now that we've got fast track under our belt, we can shift gears and do something a little deeper in terms of the inclusionary housing. And then we have uh, several projects that are in the works and we're gonna ramp up to get those uh, further down the path. And say projects, what projects? Uh, when I came on board, the community had already invested a, a hefty chunk of change of their ARPA money uh, to buy a parcel that's uh, adjacent to the downtown area where we're hoping to do uh, 35 townhouses that will be priced for sale at 90 to 100 percent of the area median income. We have a developer selected and we're now starting in the site planning process. So it's really wonderful to have a real project um, that's in the works to advance. We're having conversations with an existing nonprofit that owns some senior housing in, in town uh, and they're looking to um, expand uh, some and create some additional senior housing units on some land that they have, and also exploring uh, doing some new family housing also on the site. They've got a nice, nice good high site, also very close to the downtown area. And the third uh, project that we're working on, and I'm very excited about this because this is a joint venture that we're doing with our rec department, a very large parcel that they have been interested in for a very long time. And we are moving forward to uh, hopefully acquire it and to split the parcel up so that there will be part open space and recreation and but there'll be some affordable housing on the site also. So pretty excited about that. There's some other things that are also in the works. Uh, we've got two large developments, the town center and the gateway that they're in the development process in the permitting process. Uh, though they're a couple of years out, but we're clearly having conversations about affordable housing being a, an important piece of the residential uh, uses that get created on those sites. Uh, we're having conversations with um, developers who are looking uh, to do an annexation and really uh, as part of that annexation agreement have some level of affordable uh, affordable housing rental requirements in that. Uh, the town actually uh, developed a, a metro district policy last July that uh, gives points, very significant amount of points if you have affordable housing uh, as part of that uh, development. So we're starting to understand and work with the developers about what we really mean by that and how that will play itself out. Um, clearly, we have a small mobile park home in town that we're keeping an eye on uh, and because that's a critical piece of our housing, our affordable housing in our downtown. We're talking uh, about some potential small home development for vets and elders uh, uh, on a site that doesn't have infrastructure at the moment. We know that'll be a rate limiting factor, but you know, if you don't talk about it, it never gets done. And then uh, very close to that site, there's also a possible church Habitat for Humanity uh, partnership. So there's a lot of things sort of in the pipeline. Um, it's great to have the Cheeseman site sort of moving forward, uh, which is a very real project. Uh, and then the other things, other projects that are coming forward um, our next steps is we're going to implement the positive outcome that we got last night at the Board of Trustees. Uh, clearly, the, the Cheeseman project that I described, we're hoping to uh, test drive the new fast track process with that development. Uh, like I said, advanced uh, consideration of our inclusionary housing or of an, of a, of an inclusionary housing ordinance. And then a uh, shameless plug here, uh, I have a new housing management analyst position that we're hiring. So if anyone is really excited about everything they've seen on the slideshow, uh, please reach out to me directly. Uh, the job should be posted this week and we're looking to get somebody on board, but you can see there's a lot of interesting, heavy work to happen here in the next couple of uh, years. And it'd be a great place to get, to get your feet under you in terms of if you really wanna lean into this affordable housing and attainable housing piece and make it work in this great little town that's got great potential. So our next steps, uh, uh, we will be, see, we're, our next, you know, our next steps is really to keep advancing the projects that get housing built. You can have all the regulations and programs in the world, but if it doesn't yield housing units, then you really have to question. So we're, we're very, very dedicated to getting the housing built. Uh, we'll be seeking funding for under the strong communities infrastructure for one of our projects. 
uh, also seeking funding under land banking. So I'm in, I'm starting to draft up the letter of interest that are due this month or in August. Uh, we're looking at the uh, private activity bonds and how we can use those to the best advantage of the things that we sort of have in the hopper. And then the thing I'm really excited about is the conversations I've been having over the last couple of weeks with the University of Colorado to talk about bringing in a graduate stu uh, studio team to take a look at this large parcel that we're in partnership with the rec department on to do um, open space and affordable housing and figure out, out what site constraints are, what's the best part for housing, what's the best part for open space. So that's a wonderful opportunity to advance that project. Um, lessons learned. Uh, leadership really matters. I mean, I'll share with you that one of the things that really um, attracted me to coming out to Colorado was um, number one, the housing need, uh, but also that the town of Erie really had been making really serious efforts and we're starting to get some real traction. And I was hopeful that coming out here to work with a community that was really dedicated at the highest level to make things happen uh, would yield some good results. Town staff really matters. Uh, staffing turnover disrupts progress. So I don't wanna poach anybody for my new job, but uh, happy to have um, a new staff member join us. But you, know, you, you saw that the, uh, the first affordable housing manager that the town hired stayed less than a year. And I think that just getting in, building relationships with the folks who are the, really the, the opinion makers, the influencers in a community are critical to getting affordable housing uh, move forward. And uh, then to really establish and integrate working relationships among the affordable housing staff with the planning staff. And, and I feel very fortunate that Erie, we're all in the same department. We, you know, uh, we work very closely together. Uh, we're actually looking at uh, having one of our regular, our regular planners sort of specialize on the affordable piece, the affordable housing piece, because that, you know, there's a little nuance and, and challenges that come with the affordable housing piece that that is above and beyond sort of the standard and usual uh, development uh, process. Relationships with local boards and commissions matters. It matters big time. Uh, and and we see, uh, we, 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 we've seen a little bumps in our road here in Erie over the last couple of months, but I think we're on the other side of that. And it means that we continue to build relationships with the boards and the people who serve on those boards because they're the ones who are out in the communities having the conversations and, and want uh, to, you know, that they're dedicating their time and energy and service to the community. And we want to make sure that that's worthwhile for them yet and yields the results that the community is looking for. And then community engagement matters. You know, it's one thing to work with uh, colleagues here in, in town hall and on the boards and the commissions, but we really need to get out and meet the community where they are. So um, we're fortunate in that we're doing a very extensive outreach process for our comprehensive plan update. So that has, I've been able to sort of hop on that and work uh, shoulder to shoulder with my colleagues who are leading that effort. So it feels like a, a very fortuitous uh, happenstance that we're both working on these things at the same time and and they are so fully integrated um, that you can't talk about comprehensive plan without talking about housing and transportation and you can't talk about transportation and and planning without talking about housing so it feels like uh, all the the universe has has made it so that we're all coming together at the same point here and it feels like we're going to make some great progress so I will, with that, I will stop sharing. All right. So my name is Lisa LaRanger and I am the program manager for the Strong Communities Grant Program. Let's see if I can get my screen share going. All right, can you guys see that? Yes. All right. All right, so thank you all for coming here today and for Dr. Cog to, uh, for hosting us. And I just wanna take a quick minute and remind everybody that if you do have questions, um, please put them in the chat. All right, so um, the Infrastructure and Strong Communities Program was established by the legislature in 2022 to provide assistance for local governments to adopt policy changes and support uh, that support affordable housing and infill development 
and also that will enable them to invest in infill infrastructure projects that support affordable housing. Um, by supporting compact connected communities, we're also aiming to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, vehicle miles traveled and household transportation costs through a partnership with the Colorado Energy Office and the Colorado Department of Transportation. Over the next year, we will be distributing almost $40 million in grants to Colorado communities. Um, and if that sounds all that sounds good, um, let you know how we can get this to benefit you. All right, so the reason we're doing this um, is that studies have shown that implementing policies and planning guidelines that encourage compact and walkable neighborhoods can provide a number of benefits to communities. Um, compact development means lower development costs and maintenance costs over the long term because less infrastructure is needed to support that development. People spend more time out of their cars walking to different shops and services, which means uh, we're reducing the vehicle miles traveled, um, which also supports better air quality, which is a big concern here in the front range, um, and can also increase sales tax revenues. Um, Policy changes that reduce lot sizes and parking minimums or allow for increased density, for example, make it easier to add more housing to existing neighborhoods without having to build out costly infrastructure. For example, um, a case study in Rifle showed that by concentrating their development close to the town center and allowing for greater density could save them 31% in saved infrastructure costs. Now, granted, this is not going to be true for every community, but if you could reduce your capital and maintenance costs for your infrastructure by a third, it seems worth listening to. So they can make a lot of sense for communities taking part. So you mentioned that we had $40 million to, to hand out. So uh, we're gonna be doing that through two different uh, grant programs. The first is the planning grant program. And uh, this will be open to all Colorado counties and municipalities working toward creating sustainable development patterns or have an infill. Um, this one is just for the, for the development patterns, sorry. Um, so it will help remove some barriers to housing development and provide opportunities um, to provide more affordable and attainable housing options in your communities. Uh, we have a suggested how, uh, maximum award of $200,000 and it has a 10% match. Um, this grant can be used to cover the cost of hiring a consultant to help you with your strategy adoption, pay for a housing needs assessment, and can include administrative expenses um, that support the grant program, including staffing costs. Um, your deliverable, if selected to participate, um, will be to adopt one or more of the strategies from our list of land use best practices. Um, and you can find a link to that on our program website and I'll make a sh uh, I'll get that posted into the chat. Um, applications will open next week on Tuesday, August 1st, and they will be due um, August uh, October 1st, which I think is actually a Sunday, so I'll probably move that to Monday the 2nd. Um, we anticipate that we'll have awards um, made by December and, and grant money will be available to grantees by early spring. Um, and then if funds remain, we'll hold a second round of funding in probably in February. So the next one, uh, our next big program is the infrastructure grant program. Um, and MJ mentioned this. Um, the infrastructure grant program is also open to Colorado counties and municipalities. Um, housing authorities and nonprofits are not available or not eligible um, but they can be part of a cooperative agreement. Um, the grant T though does need to be the local county or um, local government. Uh, so with this program, um, we expect that grants will range between two and $3 million each uh, with a suggested maximum of $4 million. And there is a 20% match um, for this grant affordable housing is defined as 140% AMI for rental and home ownership um, across most of the state and 160% AMI for home ownership in rural resort counties. And there is a list of this of these counties um, and their classifications on the Department of Housing website. 
and we'll also be getting it posted on the Strong Communities website. Um, the grant will fund horizontal infrastructure, so things like water, sewer, uh, and power, or electrical upgrades and connections, um, street and sidewalk improvements, trail connections, um, even some parks. We can also cover tap fees. Um, we can also, if it is for a commercial conversion project, like converting um, a hotel or an office building to apartments, we can also cover some of the internal infrastructure for those. So to qualify for the infrastructure grant, projects need to be located in or adjacent to downtowns or business or commercial districts or along tran or near transit stations. Um, so basically we are looking for infill projects that fill in existing spaces within a community rather than greenfield development on the outskirts of town. Um, our grant process for the infrastructure grant begins with a letter of intent, which opened July 5th and will be open through August 18th. So we still have a good three weeks or so um, for you to get those in. Um, we will be holding pre-application meetings with those communities and then invite selected communities to apply for the grant in early October. Um, those grant, those applications will be due in mid-November and decisions made January 24. And we expect that the funds will be available to communities um, by late spring. So that actually does work out pretty well when you think about our construction season here in Colorado. All right, what else do you need to know? Um, again, this is only, program is only available to Colorado municipalities and counties. Um, both of the programs do focus on land use best practices. We have developed a list with input from several communities with our advisory boards. Um, and these are the ones that we think are the best and most impactful strategies communities can adopt to support compact development and affordable and attainable housing. Um, so there's a, sort of a, a list here on the screen that kind of shows um, sort of the major categories for those. Um, and again, this will be posted on the, on the website. You can scan that code to get to the website. Um, planning grantees will be expected to adopt one or more of those strategies as part of their grant agreement. And the more competitive applica applicants for the infrastructure grant program will have already adopted one or more of those strategies. Uh, for both programs, we must have all of our funds uh, committed by the end of 2024, uh, and all of our funds must be spent by October of 2026. Um, if you're interested in either of these programs, feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Um, if you're interested in applying for the infrastructure grant, we do recommend that you connect with your regional manager to ensure that your project is a good fit. And now I'm going to transition over to another program um, that is being offered through DOLA, the Energy and Mineral Impact Assistance Fund, um, and specifically the More Housing Now initiative. So this program has $20 million in funding through June 30th of 2026, um, as they're until they're gone. Um, and it is very similar to the Strong Communities Program, which in turn is also very similar to the 1271 uh, pro uh, program that Mitch talked about. Um, so, More Housing Now provides local government land use planning grants. Um, these have a 10% match and um, encourage people to, uh, communities to uh, do the housing needs assessments, fair share agreements, um, and other work that can support and inform strategy selection, uh, but they must also include a strategy adoption, and they, those can be from strong communities or 1271 um, or other similar types of policies. The infrastructure grant um, funds public infrastructure that supports infill affordable housing. Um, more housing now has a 25% match and a $2 million maximum. Um, and can only fund the public infrastructure. Um, applications for these programs are due August 1st, which is next week. Um, awards are expected in November and um, a second round will be open in December, um, depending on remaining funds. If you're interested in either of these programs, please contact your DLG, uh, your Division of Local Government. We're very fond of the acronyms and the state. Um, your 
local regional manager um, and they can provide more information on that. Um, so little comparison because they are very similar but have some differences. So uh, the planning programs are both pretty similar. Um, they are recommending that you try and go for the strong communities program first. Um, the infrastructure grants, um, so there is the difference in the, the maximum award. Um, more housing now is $2 million versus strong communities is $4 million. Um, the location um, is more flexible with the More Housing Now program versus Strong Communities. Strong Communities has um, a very strict definition of what we can consider infill based on, our, on the leg legislation um, and timing. Um, so as I mentioned, the applications for the More Housing Now program is closing August 1st for the first round. Um, second round will be December. Um, staffing capacity is the other issue to consider. Um, so we can consider some staff time with the planning grant uh, for strong communities, um, but also um, consider your staffing capacity to manage these grants. Um, more housing now is state funds, uh, which most of you are probably more familiar with and strong communities is uh comes from the arpa funds um so there are some federal regulations that we need to make sure that we're we're meeting with those um so i'm not an expert on more housing now program if you do have questions on those please reach out to your uh regional managers um but from that I'm going to turn it over to Robin DeFalco uh, to talk about Proposition 123. When, thanks, Lisa. Um, so my name is Robin DeFalco. I'm with the Division of Local Government, and I'm here today to share a pretty high-level overview of Prop 123. Um, congrats, Erie, for submitting your um, commitment and opting in to access all the funding that's available. Um, I am with the Division of Local Government within DOLA, and um, so there are a number of state agencies involved in Prop 123, and I'm just the messenger to point you in the right direction of all these funding resources and um, help you understand how to apply. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So there is a lot of new money available. The key point I want to emphasize is that this New money isn't going to solve our housing crisis across Colorado, but it is money that wasn't available a month ago, and it will make a big dent. Um, we want to make sure all of your local governments can access these funds. Um, and the first thing I want to highlight is that the first year that just started as of July 1st, um, only half the funds are available. That's $160 million. Next year, we'll have a full fiscal year of funding available. So we're starting small, it gets bigger next year, but there is a lot of new money available that can add to your capital stack as you um, tackle the affordable housing issues in your own community. Um, I want to point out that DOLA is one of the agencies doing funding programs. DOLA receives 40% of the funds while OEDIT or the um, Office of International and Economic Development um, receives the other 60% and they have selected Chaffa as their administrator for those funds. Next slide, please. All right, so DOLA's um, funding is both with the Division of Housing and the Division of Local Government. Um, Based on the statute, um, the 40% that DOLA will be administering includes a lot of funding for home ownership programs, a variety of different home ownership programs, down payment assistance programs, um, that sort of thing. And then there is a large chunk of funding available for homelessness response programs. And those are programs not necessarily building housing, but serving the homeless population, support services, et cetera. 
And then our office in the Division of Local Government will be managing the Local Planning Capacity Development Program, which is a small pot of funding, relatively speaking. We do have 3 million the first year and 6 million the next year. Um, and that will help local governments address the affordable housing crisis in their community. Broadly speaking, there will be some nuance and details, but that is money to help you get there, help you achieve your goals with Prop 123. Next slide, please. All right, so I am not with Chaffa or OEdit, so again, I'm just the messenger, but 60% of the funds from Prop 123 are going to um, these agencies and they will administer three primary grant programs. Um, someone, we have some background noise if you wanted to mute yourself. Um, so the three funding programs include land banking, um, an equity financing program with a tenant equity vehicle, um, which is a pretty new concept in Colorado, and some um, debt or concessionary debt financing. So all of their programs are available on their website. If you visit the um, Chaffa website, you will see their Prop 23 Learn More right at the top of their page, or you can Google search Colorado Affordable Housing Financing Fund and you'll get there. Um, I did wanna highlight that the land banking program has a LOI is open right now. Um, if your community has not yet opted in to Prop 123, which I'll talk about in a minute, don't worry about that. You can still submit an LOI and as long as you have opted in by the time full applications um, take place. So um, those LOIs are open through August 21st and their concessionary debt program is likely opening in September to be announced. Um, next slide. All right, thanks. So in order for your jurisdiction, in order for any project to be eligible for Prop 123 funds, the local government jurisdiction must opt in, so to speak. Um, you opt in by establishing your baseline of affordable housing and then filing a commitment to increase affordable housing by 3% annually or 9% over three years. So I wanna say again that projects, housing projects can access these Prop 123 funds, developers, nonprofits, housing authorities, other third party agencies that may be providing homelessness response services. Um, but in order for that project to be eligible to apply, the jurisdiction must have opted in or filed their commitment. So Erie, for example, is on the list of communities that have opted in. So a developer looking at a project will say, great, I can access some Prop 123 dollars to help with my capital stack for my project in Erie. Um, a number of large jurisdictions have opted in and several small as well, Boulder, Boulder County, Colorado Springs, and Denver, Durango. I'm not gonna name them all, but um, we hope that most jurisdictions will opt in by the November 1st deadline. Um, uh, next slide, please. And then I just wanna note an exception to the rule um, briefly is that homelessness response programs, if you're serving individuals, not building housing, those programs do not require the opt-in. So a nonprofit, for example, that is serving homeless populations, they don't need to worry about whether or not the jurisdiction has opted in. For the most part, everyone else does. So the baseline assistance tool is available. I've just posted the link and the commitment filing site is available. So if you haven't explored this yet, please save these links and check them out. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, all of these resources Again, I'm going very high level, but all of these resources are available on our DOLA Engage website um, for Prop 123, where you will find articles explaining how Prop 123 works, frequently asked questions. You can post your own questions and someone will respond to you. Um, there are all of the links I just shared earlier, recordings of live webinars. So there are a lot of great resources there and um, we hope you utilize that site. 
All right, next slide, please. So a lot of jurisdictions are asking for some assistance in figuring out their baseline and how to file their commitment in order to unlock all the millions of dollars that are available. Uh, hundreds of millions that are available. So um, our office is coordinating some technical assistance um, now through October leading up to that November 1st deadline. And if you would like to take advantage of that technical assistance, please sign up. I've just posted a link to a Google form. It's quick and easy. Tell us a little bit about your needs and um, you will be on our list to receive updates. The game plan is that we're launching some webinars in the next um, weeks. I hope by the end of the week, we'll be announcing our webinar dates. Um, those webinars will be tailored to different community types. For example, larger urban communities versus smaller municipalities, um, unincorporated counties, um, rural and rural resort communities. So those webinars will be tailored explore how to do your baselines and file your commitments. And then we'll follow up with some work sessions in a small group regional setting. So we might bring together a county and the municipalities within that county to kind of work together, explore their baselines and commitments, and then um, provide additional support as needed. Um, I am putting the contact information in the chat to reach out to either me or Andy Hill from the Community Development Office if you have more questions. So that about wraps it up for me. And I think I'm the last presenter today, which means we can open it up for a Q&A session. And I'll turn to our, our hosts with Dr. Cog. Do you want people to post in the chat or post in the Q&A? How are we navigating this? Yeah, the chat would be great. Um, so if folks want to drop some questions in in the chat it should be open i know earlier it wasn't um but it should be open now for anyone to message uh us i have one question that i received um earlier and it is for wheat ridge but i think um if anyone else wants to chime in please go ahead um so the question was, I'd like to know how Wheat Ridge was able to educate their council and was it effective? Are they on board now with affordable housing or will that be addressed during their comp plan update? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and like I said, there were there was kind of surprising skepticism that we got. Um, so we did we did pivot. Um, and for the most part, we, we it did work actually. Um, and what we did specifically was um basically get into the weeds and the numbers and keep it kind of a look at it sort of objectively as a sort of quantitative exercise. And so we had our um consultants that were willing to kind of pivot and build out a We Ridge specific scenario spreadsheet um, where we basically gave it to council and had a work session <clears throat> where we inputted all kinds of data about um, land costs, construction costs, things like that, um, and kind of broke it down by unit type. And then it spit out a number of like, this is what it costs per unit to build um and 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 that really um i mean they they got into it it was interesting how we did it we were pretty strategic about it we like pulled them out of the city council chambers and put them in a separate room there's like a psychological thing there right when they're not on camera even though it's a public meeting and they feel more comfortable asking candid questions and so we got them in a more relaxed environment and just went through this spreadsheet and they all were really engaged with it and kind of like wanted to get into the weeds on the numbers and why does it cost so much to do that? Why is land? And so that was the most effective thing we did. Um, and that was sort of the foundation for the conversation that kind of spun off into more qualitative things. But, um, and I mean, things aren't perfect, obviously, but I mean, as an example, we went from, um, you know, a year and a half ago, projects getting turned down that were offering some affordability to, we just recently had our council approve a transitional housing project um, on one of our commercial corridors that in our estimation as city staff wouldn't see in the light of day before this conversation. So I think it came down to an objective kind of numbers exercise for us, frankly, um, is how we kind of got them there. But it'd be curious to see what others, if others experience that too. 
Yeah, we used, <laughs> um, we had the same consultant. <laughs> so CZB, uh, this is their plug. Um, they actually gave us a lot of those similar numbers um, for, for the Erie landscape. And that was really helpful for our, our council, or our, which is our board of trustees out here. Um, I would say it was still difficult with our, our planning commission was um, probably the more skeptical of the two bodies. And we even brought in, as MJ mentioned, we brought in Don Elliott to kind of give a national perspective, as well as um, MJ provided the local. And so the educational piece was there, um, but uh, in, in a, it, it was just more effective with our board members versus our planning commission. Um, and I'll add to that, one of the things that we did the night we had Don Elliott in is, is I asked each of the planning commissioners to think about their own housing story and to personalize that and to think about, you know, how they had moved through housing, how they got to where they were and whether or not they could actually afford to buy the home in Erie that they're in right now, if they weren't already here. You know, that's just one piece that, you know, I think that you have to really push on all the buttons to try to make it real for them. And at times, you know, you, it means looking at their own story. That's helpful. And that reminds me, similar to what we did, actually, we, when we did community engagement, we asked the question, basically, are, how worried are you about affordability? And then how worried are you about others being able to affordable? And it was like a really interesting metric that really resonated with the council, yeah. that more qualitative, like, oh, people want, you know, they want their kids to be able to live there and all that kind of thing that's more resonates by for certain people. And it was like a big flip. It was like, 20% of people were worried about their own affordability, but like 80% were worried about, 80% of the same people were worried about others' affordability. So it was like a very clear sort of qualitative thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we actually, what did help us um, is further backing up of our, we took our community, the our, our town-wide community survey, which is statistically uh, significant uh, results. And we added questions into that regarding um, people's concern about affordable housing so that even if a board member um, wasn't overly concerned about it, it did actually show that well over 70% of our community were either personally or concerned overall for affordability. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat um at this time i don't know if anyone has questions for the dola folks um who are here i know they sent a lot of uh links out they were really prepared uh today so um i you may be able to raise your hand and ask a question if that's more convenient but um we can wait a couple minutes but if we have no other questions then uh that's all we have for you and I would add that there's some really some upcoming deadlines that are, you know, pretty soon. So if you do have any questions, we really want to get you, your foot in the door if we can. A couple August 1st deadlines, August 18th, among others. So reach, uh, raise your hand now or reach out via email afterward, but uh, we'd be happy to connect either way. I just, I will put a plug in for uh, we the fast track um, uh, code amendment that we just did for Erie last night. That was actually um, kind of inspired by the, the APA's um, zoning and uh, zoning with equity and zoning um, policy that was adopted earlier um, this year and folk which emphasized for affordable housing, especially having an administrative review process uh, is really <laughs> helps. It not only helps with time, but it helps with some of the NIMBY pushback that we can get. And um, so that actually allows for any project that's 12% affordable or more. So that means of the total units, 12% or more of the, them are at either 80% for rental uh, of the AMI or 120, up to 120% for ownership, um, that those qualify. So that and it's significant for us because our regular process is, could be over two years and multiple uh 
connections with the board for approvals. And so this helps us just, um, yeah, move these projects through much faster. Uh, if I could, Sarah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to point out that Fast Track is a component of Prop 123. It does not kick in until 2027, or I should say, by 2026, when you go to file your commitment for 2027, you will need to demonstrate that your community has achieved fast track for affordable housing. So what Sarah just described is great, and we think a lot of communities will be working on that strategy, that expedited development review, which is a component of um, the 1271 IHOP program. Many communities looking at that currently, um, I believe Lisa's program with strong communities also will has a strategy similar to that. Mm -hmm. um, but our office will be coming out with some guidelines and best practices about a variety of different approaches to achieve that. So Erie's approach may be perfect for a community like theirs and a different community may need a completely different type of approach depending on their size and the type of um, how much development happens in that community. Um, but it is worth mentioning that that's something I think a lot of communities are looking at right now. Yeah, we hope that we'll be able to be well practiced <laughs> by 26. So uh, here's another question. It's actually similar to the one I asked earlier. Um, did either of you, um, we read your Erie, did you get any pushback from community members? Um, and how did you handle that? Yeah, I'll go first. We, we got less pushback than we thought we would get. Um, I think, I mean, I, I have only theories as to why that's the case, but because we, we certainly did community engagement. Um, but my theory is that, you know, and, and going back to one of the slides I had is kind of how we framed the project as more of a technical exercise. Um, we had been hearing from the community that it's an issue, like the numbers show that it's an issue from our own surveys and things like that. Um, and council felt very strongly um, once they came around that, that it was an issue. So um, we did not get as much as we thought, I think in part because of the technical aspect of it, but then also, I mean, let's be honest, we didn't do any, like I said, map-based recommendations for change in specific areas. And that's really where the rub is, right? Where you actually, so the concept, right? As a community member coming to an open house and seeing a display board that says, you know, we need a naturally occurring affordable housing program. They might be like, oh, they might roll their eyes a little bit or whatever, or be like, oh, that's a good idea. But when you're actually right, doing a comprehensive plan or some sub area plan that's actually showing where you're allocating density, um, you know, that's where, and we deliberately didn't do that because we were about to do a comp plan and we thought that was the appropriate lane for that. But, um, so that's my theory. And I, 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 I would be shocked if when we actually came to map based recommendations that, that that's where the, you know the fiery conversations happen right but this so we needed to take just sort of baby steps right because we hadn't done anything and our whole approach was we need to do something we need to do it soon because development pressure continues and we're seeing more and more projects and we're missing opportunities so that was a strategic decision was to stay at that level in part because we knew or we suspected that community pushback would be it, it would cause a lot of delays and a lot of problems and it wasn't the appropriate mechanism right to to um to, to do those sort of map based recommendations so that's what comes to mind for me and i think jeff you're so right in terms of you know the rubber hits the road when you have a specific project that's being proposed on a specific site you know we were fortunate enough in erie number one that the leadership you know at the council or the trustees level was you know strong and un unrelenting uh, they've been, you know, really put their shoulders to the wheel on that. And that's been great to have. You know, the challenge we had was, was with our planning commission, who really weren't believing that it was really an issue that we should be tackling. And then, you know, we were talking about the details of the housing needs assessment. And then also when we did the community-wide survey that, you know, really showed a very strong concern around the affordable housing. That was, you know, an additional... Um, quiver, you know, an arrow in our quiver to be able to make the argument. And we feel that because of that, we really were success in moving forward with the fast track permitting. And, you know, the commitment to for Proposition 123, you know, we, we were all talking about what that meant. I think it's, 
easier for small communities that don't have a history of having done much on affordable housing creation to really hop over the bar that you need to with the Prop 123. So Erie felt well poised to be able to, you know, we already had the municipal leadership that was saying, yeah, we're really interested and we want to do something about this. Then the numbers were very achievable for us. I mean, I want to be candid that our baseline number uh, has us producing five affordable units a year for the next three years. We think that's very manageable. Everyone said, well, that's too low. And we said, yes, that's too low, but we will absolutely hop over that bar. We expect to, you know, perform very significantly higher than that, but we were happy to sort of, you know, the Proposition 123, in my mind, is really communities sort of saying, yeah, we got to step forward and lean into this issue and take some leadership. And that's the real piece of the commitment more so than the actual numbers. The numbers will be important, but if the commitment's not there and you just have these numbers you're supposed to produce, you're you're going to have challenges. But I do think that, uh, you know, like I said, the, the broader community input and engagement and education, and it doesn't stop here, it'll be ongoing. And as we move forward with some of the projects that I was defining, you know, there's going to be some, you know, interesting conversations and some concerns about what that means for that particular site in that particular neighborhood. Uh, but we're, you know, we're confident that it's a it's a community wide conversation with very good leadership um, at the municipal level. So we're, we're very hopeful. Yeah, and we're also hoping to use our comp plan process, which is now going on now to similar to Jeff um, have the conversation. A lot of people are more concerned about growth of any kind than at this point for what we, you know, as opposed to the specific projects. Um, so we'll see how that pans out. Yeah. And the point about missed opportunities is true. You know, we, we have a number of units that have already been permitted. And, and I think the next thing we start thinking about is even though they've already been, you know, permitted or entitled or platted or whatever the language is you use here in Colorado, is there a way to capture some of those things that have already been through, gone through the approval process and to find a way to, to bend them into the affordable housing um, income range? And so that will be very interesting, especially as we see the market change up on us. All right. Well, this is your last chance. Um, oh, we have something in the Q&A. Um, do any of you have guidance on messaging baseline commitments with local elected officials? In terms of at getting local officials to agree with the baseline or just not be shocked by the baseline? <laughs> I, what I, I would say, if that latter is um, the point of the question, I mean, yeah, um, it's just pointing out that if we don't meet the baseline, there's no penalty, and that there's time to every um, there's time to complete projects. There's a three-year window, and there's, even though you're committing to a certain number in that three-year window, you just have extra time. Like you, you can't commit to more and get more funding. But if projects take longer to get off the ground, there's no harm or foul there. You're just able to finish your commitment and then reapply later. So it takes some of the pressure off. And I'll say that, uh, you know, the, the uh, Prop 123 is a 3% increase and clearly um, Erie's participation in the Boulder County Regional Housing Partnership set the bent, you know, the marker much higher up at 12% uh, by 2035. So the original conversation we were having with leadership here was like only 3%, which was a great conversation to be having with them. And we said, let's get in, let's do what we need to do to satisfy the commitment that Prop 123 is asking us to do better to under promise and over deliver than over promise and under deliver. So on that on that with the numbers that we had, it was a it was not a challenging um, argument to make and they supported that. Yeah, I would echo we, you're you're further along than we are. We haven't filed our commitment yet, but our approach and we are planning to go to our council to get a resolution of support, which I understand is not required, but we kind of got the sense that maybe it's encouraged. Um, so I think there's a number of ways to do it. I think some communities I've heard have just gone for it and just filed on their own without consulting. Um, but 
our approach as far as communications with our council and our leadership for the baseline is that to focus more on what what Sarah just Sarah and Imogen just said, which is basically like it's almost like a no brainer in some ways to just go ahead and file the commitment because um, you know it gets you three years of eligibility, right? And the the, the drawback would be you don't meet the nine percent and you lose one year of eligibility. So I was just writing up the memo. It's like 2023 to 2026, you get funds available. You don't meet the 9%. Then in 2027, you have a year gap. So it's just one year, but then you can reapply as I understand it and then be eligible for the subsequent year. So um, I'm not, I think this is in part because we don't have a lot of resources to dive into this, but it's also in part like, um, it seems like, um, a, a clear decision for council if it's framed the right way. And as far as the baseline goes, not to downplay it, but basically to, to have that be almost secondary in the messaging of like, we use the DOLA baseline assistance tool. We're going to use the technical assistance. We're going to get the number, what we feel is most appropriate for We Ridge and, um, and not, you know, try to maybe steer them out of the lane of analysis paralysis and thinking that we're going to get like uh, fixate on the number and getting it just right when it's really just a bit of a crapshoot as far as I can tell. Um, so that sounds bad, but the numbers are all over the place, right? So um, that's our hope and our approach. And uh, we'll see how it goes, though. They may want to fixate on that baseline. We'll see. The follow up, um, I think, to Sarah's question was uh, to understand why action is important on making a commitment to. So, okay, we have a couple more questions here. Um, how do you reconcile the large amount of new development by metro districts with these various funding programs that are trying to incentivize affordable housing development through infrastructure grants, planning grants, et cetera? Cities like mine depend heavily upon metro districts. These are quasi-government entities that seem totally isolated from everything we are doing here. Yeah, we are. Uh... We do too in Erie. Uh, most uh, um, most of our new housing projects do have a metro district, and um, we created a metro district. Uh, sorry, a special district policy last year that has a point system that uh, MJ alluded to a little bit in our presentation. Um, the points require that you meet a certain minimum number of points for affordable or attainable housing. And so in order to um, have your approval, um, the uh, our board of trustees takes into account what are you providing? And we've, we have affordable and attainable housing requirements, a menu of those, as well as sustainability and transportation and connectivity and other types of public benefits um, that essentially we hope that the developer will um, commit to. And that is part of the conversation for how their um, metro district is considered. I don't know if that answers that, but now they can't use metro district money to fund the affordable housing, but in the overall scheme of the project, that is what we're asking them to commit to. And I will add that for the Strong Communities Program, while the metro districts are not eligible to apply for the grants and be the grantee, they can be a partner with a municipality or a county government. Um, the, the match can come, it doesn't just have to come from the municipality or the local government, it can come from multiple sources. Um, so they could be a partner in those programs, um, just like a, a housing district or something like that could could be partnered on those grants. That's interesting. Okay, we have one more question here. Um, I think this is directed at uh, Wheat Ridge and Erie again. Um, how do you see the housing plans being incorporated into the comp plan updates? Yeah, I can jump in on that. So our specific housing strategy has um, some zoning recommendations in it. So, so basically to create a new zoning framework that um, allows more density, a, a new zoning district that allows more density than what we have um, with an inclusionary component. 
And so the specific thing that comes to mind for me is that the comp plan, you know, would build off of the policies and the recommendations, but take the strategy, housing strategy recommendations and start to look at assigning uh, in the future land use map component of the comp plan. So, so we're looking to, the housing strategy said, create a new R4 zone district, right? An R4 zone district in our case would allow more density in exchange for an inclusionary requirement and some other standards. And so it would be basically building off of that and in our future land use map saying, uh, you know, in these corridors or these locations, R4 would be appropriate or some other um, type of density. Um, and then a further refinement of the policies um, as part of the comp plan that build off of the strategy. But um, I guess like everybody, you know, there's always parallel plans and strategies going on and they tend to muddy each other. But I think um, we hope that they'll sync up pretty well. Yeah, in Erie, we've been, you know, like I said, I came on board in April and uh, we've been doing, I've been side by side with the uh, planners who are working on the comprehensive plan update. I mean, it feels like it's getting very integrated. I'm not sure how that will formalize itself into the final plan, um, but it feels like, it almost feels like the same process in some ways that you don't talk about the comprehensive plan for the future of a community without housing be a, being a big piece of that, especially given the fact that, you know, Erie is a bedroom community right now. We're looking to accomplish other goals uh, in terms of mobility and, you know, good sustainable land use and what that means for our future. Uh, and it feels like it needs to be very much integrated to the comprehensive plan. But I'm also relatively new on the staff, so I don't want to overstate the role <laughs> that the housing component will play in the comprehensive plan update. It's going to be messy. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But it's a great question. Well, I think that is everything. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Get a few minutes before lunch. Um, back and thank you to all of our panelists for doing a great job. And if anyone has any questions, we'll be sending out all of the info and hopefully all the info in the chat that got posted as well. Um, after the um, after this webinar is over. So thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.